What's up, West Market Campus? How are we doing this morning? How is the best campus in the network? I say that at, I say that at all the churches. I'm uh, sorry, so, but... Uh, <laughs> Hey, listen, we are continuing uh, this series called Dangerous Thoughts. We've been diving into some of the thoughts that kind of circulate in Christian circles that are not actually, they don't line up with reality, and more importantly, they don't line up with Scripture. And so it's a problem. Like, if we begin to act on things that aren't true, that's not good, right? And so, so far, we've talked about some things like uh, you have to be good enough for God to accept you. And we talked about that. We talked about how uh, also that the, that the Old Testament, some people think the Old Testament is no longer relevant. And we talked about that as well. Uh, and then, you know, we also talked about the idea that if I feel something, it must be God's will for me. That, that hey, if, I, if that's what I'm feeling, then okay, that must be how God made me or how, how I should, uh, how I, what I should pursue. Um, and, you know, some, what you believe and what you think really matters because what you believe and what you think is really going to kind of shape how you act. So it's very, very important. And some thoughts are going to ground you more in your relationship with God and, and push you closer to God. And some things are going to do the opposite and push you away from your relationship with God and, and from how reality works and how God's world actually works. So today, I'm really going to challenge you. I'm really going to push you. I'm going to make your head hurt. I'm sorry. Like, I just, I'm not sorry that I'm talking about this topic. I'm sorry that there's no way to talk about it without making your head hurt. So, uh, so hang with me today. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a stretch, but this is so absolutely important. What we're going to talk about today is one of the thoughts that is driving most of uh, where, uh, you know, what most of some of the strange, dangerous thoughts that we're hearing in Christian circles today, this is what is behind it. Uh, this is a topic that we really should be really, really interested in, but it's not that exciting to talk about. Uh, and, and so we struggle to see the relevance of it unless we really understand how much it's affecting us, and more importantly, how much it's affecting our kids. And that is, that is a huge, huge thing. And I'm going to make a statement here that, that is going to seem a little bold, but here it is. If this theological trend continues to become the prevailing thought of the next generation, there won't be any life-changing, life-transforming, Jesus-preaching churches in 20 years. That's how important this situation is. Now, let me just, let me kind of moderate that just a little bit. I personally have a whole lot of confidence in the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to prevail, and that it's, that's not going to happen. But at the same time, we can't be asleep, right? We can't just say, oh, well, God will take care of it, so we're just not going to worry about this. So this is so, so important. So here's what I want to do. I want to start with just some thoughts that you're hearing. My, you might see memes of this or, or, you know, just short blogs or whatever that you've, that you've seen that say these types of things. You might even see bumper stickers that say some of this type of stuff. But just to kind of start wrapping our heads around the overall idea that we're talking about this morning. So here we go. Here's some thoughts that you see out there. First of all, that verse just doesn't resonate with me. You heard anybody ever say that? Now, there's a sense in which sometimes we look at a verse and we go, ugh, that one hurts. I uh, struggle with that one. But I still believe it's God's word and I feel like I need, to, I need to adhere to it, right? So, like, that's one thing. But just saying, hey, that verse doesn't resonate with me, so therefore I don't really think that's something I need to worry about. That verse doesn't resonate with me. Or maybe you've heard this, my God would never Right? And again, there's a, there's, a, there's a good way to say that. Like if you're saying, hey, the God that I see in Scripture would not. Okay. But w well, when people say that, typically what they're saying is, is my God, the God that I will accept and I'm okay with, that I feel good about, would never. And so you hear that a lot of times. Another one is, listen, this is huge right now. It's not sin that separates us from God. It's shame. You're hearing that a lot right now. And maybe you, maybe you don't, you're not, you know, kind of in theological circles, but that's a big one right now. It's not sin, it's the shame. We'll, we'll kind of come back to that. This one, uh, 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 love is love. You see in that nowadays? Uh, or how about this one? We now have a much deeper understanding of God than Paul and Peter did. We'll come back to that one. Um, the God of the Old Testament is very different from the God of the New Testament. Um, how about this one? I think Jesus would say that differently today. Oh, yeah, let's give Jesus a do-over. He would like to say that differently now. Uh, and so uh, it's not as important that we find answers as it is that we ask questions. And we'll come back to that one as well. And then the last one is this, just, and we, we covered this, if that's how you feel, that's how God made you. 
These are the kind of things that you're going to see. You see in blogs, you see in social media posts, um, and, and they often sound good and they're catchy, uh, but they're leading to a dangerous place. And for your children who are forming their opinions at a time where having an unpopular opinion will get you canceled or deplatformed or fired, it's much easier to be drawn to these kinds of concepts and these, this type of thinking because it's socially acceptable. For those, uh, for, for those who don't know what uh, truth really sounds like, these are very appealing. Now just think about that. If you don't know what truth actually is, this stuff is very, very appealing. That, and just to give you an example, you know, all of us have friends, or maybe it's you, and if it is, I'm sorry, that, that like there's an element of food you, you're not allowed to eat, right? It, you can't eat it. It might be sugar. It might be uh, gluten. It might be dairy or, the, you know, those kind of things. And when you're in that situation, what do you try to do? The, you know, the, the thing you try to do is you try to recreate something that you love but you're not allowed to eat anymore with the elements you're allowed to eat, right? So if you can't have gluten, you, you know, try to figure out cauliflower pizza, you know, and that kind of stuff, or sugar-free brownies or, or whatever it is. And, and what's interesting is if, you, if you've ever, you know, been around those kind of situations where, where somebody is, has cooked their version of something, a lot of times they'll hand it to you and say, you need to try this. And what do they say? It tastes just like the real thing, right? That's what they say. It tastes just like the real thing. And I don't know like how, what your experience has been with that, but most of the time when I pop that in my mouth, I think to myself, it's not bad, but it's not the real thing. I mean, don't you think that? Like you think, well, it's got some sweetness to it and it tastes chocolatey, but it doesn't taste like a brownie that has real sugar in it, you know, or real gluten in it or, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and, and so like it, it, there's that quest to try to make it like the real thing, but it's not the real thing, right? Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, that, that's, that's kind of where we are theologically right now. Is, is we don't know, and, and I, I think one of the reasons that people do that is because it's been a while since they had the real thing. Think about it. You know, if you've been gluten-free for 10 years, like when's the last time you had a brownie with gluten in it? You know, like, so you don't know. So you're like, hey, this is awesome. This is really good. You should try it. And it's like, nah, it's not quite. And then theologically, that's where we are right now is we don't know the truth well enough to know when somebody's handing us a theological gluten-free brownie. We don't know. We just like, it's like, okay, you know, I, I wouldn't know the difference because it's been so long since I had the real thing. So it's so very important. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to introduce a line of thinking or really just kind of unveil it because you've seen it. You may just not recognize it. So we're going to rip the veil off this morning and talk about some of the dangers and then also talk about what we can do about it. So here we go. Are you ready for me to hurt your heads? How many people are ready? Yes. All right. I love your excitement. We'll see if in about five minutes you still have it. Here we go. Here's the concept that is really prevailing among our young people today when it comes to theology. It's called progressive theology. Progressive theology. And here's just my definition of that, okay? The belief that theology is always evolving and changing, especially as mankind gains a better understanding of the world and itself, and then, of course, God, which, of course, it says at the beginning, theology, which is the study of God, is always evolving. So what that means is, is that our beliefs don't have to exclusively come from the Bible that, that, that they, we can extrapolate beyond the Bible. That's, that's, what's, that's really being pushed hard in our culture today. Uh, which, by the way, let me say something. I, you guys do an awesome job of posting uh, like screen, screen, uh, shots of the screen and things like that. Just make sure during this series that people know that that's the dangerous thought. Okay, like just, just make sure that they understand that. Uh, uh, that it's not like our bottom line. That if I feel it, it must be God's will. Ah, you know, and like, I was like, what are they preaching over there? Uh, so, so just make sure people know that's a dangerous thought. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's the concept is that, is that, you know, hey, the Bible kind of got us down the road, but we can kind of take, we can go beyond the Bible. We can extrapolate beyond the Bible and think, okay, what does God want now in our culture? As opposed to continue to look back to the Bible and say, this is what God says. How does that apply to our culture? Does that make sense? It's a diff totally different thought. So here's some, here's some thoughts that kind of stem out of that that you may have seen. Um, and, and maybe you'll begin to recognize it. I just want to try to help you wrap your brain around just what we're talking about. So here we are. First of all, loving your neighbor is defined by culture, not the Bible. That's that's. That's right there in that line of thinking. And so, in other words, you know, the, the, the ethics of the Bible may be outdated now. So, therefore, we need to define what love is and loving our neighbor by the culture that's around us. 
Uh, and so if we feel like something's unloving, even if God said, yeah, no, that's what you should be doing, like, no, we don't do that. Because, you know, and I think if God, if Jesus was here today, he probably would tell us not to do that because it's not, it's not loving in our culture. Um, and so it's kind of that, that idea that, that loving your neighbor is defined by culture. Second thing is historical theological terms like inspiration of the Bible or atonement are redefined. Because remember, we understand God better now than the classic thinkers from the last 2,000 years that largely agree. Um, and so, and listen, you may say, hey, listen, I know that I know some thinkers didn't agree in the past. I know that there were whole branches of the church and that kind of thing. But when you look at the people who always looked at Scripture, not to a man, not to a leader, that kind of thing, but to Scripture, you see widespread agreement on the main things for 2,000 years. Uh, and so, you know, but, but we look at these things and we start to redefine them. So somebody may say, do you believe in the inspiration of the Bible? And they say, oh, yeah, absolutely. And then you ask them to define it. And they say, well, I think they're, they were inspired as in, you know, the writers were inspired as in they were uh, excited, they were motivated, you know, that kind of thing. Like if you heard a good speech and you were inspired. Uh, that's not actually what, what inspiration is, you know. So, so, so they don't necessarily think that the words of Scripture came directly from God. And so, uh, so there's this redefining. Then there's this one, re rejection of absolute answers. Now listen, there is no doubt that there are some things in Scripture that are hard to wrap your head around. Like, there's some things that it's just like you just look at it and you think, man, every which way I look at it, I'm not 100% sure what's going on there. There's no doubt of that. But at the same time, there are some extremely, and, and, and all the things that our faith is founded on are extremely clear in Scripture. Spelled out, obvious, you know, a 10-year-old can read it and go, oh, yeah, that's what that means. What's kind of funny about that is a 10-year-old can read it and say that that's what that means. But then we have, you know, scholars who are looking at it trying to make it sound like it means everything except for what it actually means. Um, and so, uh, but what we see is, is, is in our culture, uh, you know, being, being confident in those answers, people think, well, that's a lack of transparency. It's a lack of honesty. It's a lack of having an open mind. One progressive website says it this way. We believe there is more value in questioning than in absolutes. And this is a trend all through our culture, uh, but, but uh, it's made its way into theology. And so once you settle on an answer, you become an exclusive bigot. Like, oh, you know, you think you have all the answers. Well, it's just that the Scripture is clear, and this is what God says. So, you know, it's not me. It's this is what God says. Now, here's the thing. It's not that we can't ask questions. In fact, one of the things I love about all of our campuses, um, and this one, I think, is the best at this. I think you are absolutely the best, is that you, you're just so welcoming to folks asking questions and asking questions and saying, hey, I don't understand this. Is it okay if I ask this? Because a lot of people, what they've run into in Christian circles is if they ask a question, they're treated like, well, how could you dare question something? How could you question God? How could you, you know, you know, no, absolutely not. You know what that is? That's insecurity. You know, the reason that, that, that any question is, is, is fair game and we're so excited for anybody to be here and say, I don't understand this. Can you please show me, you know, how does this work? I don't get it. You know, because the reason we're, we're, we're not worried about that, that doesn't threaten us, we're, we love questions, is because we're really confident in God's answers. God has some amazingly solid answers for every part of your life. So, so you know, it doesn't, it doesn't worry us. And, and we're so confident in the power of the Word of God. It's not my job to convince you. God's Word is, and when you get it, and you start interacting with God's Word, it's just going to light you up. Like, I mean, you're just going to be like, man, this is, man, God is moving in my life because of what I'm seeing in the Word of God. We're so confident in that. And so, you know, we're not, we're not afraid of questions. Qu questions are amazing. But the idea that we're, that we're constantly asking questions and we're not interested in the answers, actually, that's kind of dishonest, right? Like, that's like, like, what's the point? What is the point of asking the questions? And then we have reinterpretation of ancient positions, positions on morality and doctrine to fit modern culture. Now, listen, we live in a culture where everybody has a say on everything. And that has really shaped us. I mean, really shaped us. When, some of you, if you're under 30, you will not understand this. But when, when I was coming up and young adult, you literally could work at a place for 10 years before anybody would look at you and say, well, you seem like you have valuable opinions. What's your opinion on this? Literally. Like, li literally, like, like, it could be 10 years before anybody cared in an organization what you thought. If you wanted to, if you wanted to shape culture with your opinion, you had to become famous, like, you couldn't just post something. Like, you, you had to become famous. And only about, you know, 
150 people in all of our culture really got paid attention to. Like, I mean, that, that literally was what was going on, you know. But if you're under 30, somebody handed you a cell phone in about middle school, and ever since then, you've been able to weigh in on everything. And so as a culture, we really struggle now with this idea that God is the God of the universe, and he made everything, and he sets the rules, and we don't really get to weigh in on that. Like, that's really hard for us nowadays. Like, I, I don't get that. Like, how, what do you mean I don't get to weigh in on that? Well, what about my truth? <laughs> you know, I was like, what? when did you have a truth? Uh, but, um, but uh, you know, we struggle with that. And then there's a lack of understanding of our fallenness. Elisa Childers, which I really encourage you to follow, she says this. She says, according to this counterfeit truth, you don't need to deny yourself and repent. You just need to realize that you were never separated from God in the first place. You are perfect just as you are. At the root of a whole lot of worldviews that are in our culture right now, there is this concept of not understanding we are broken. We are fallen. There's something wrong in us that only Jesus can fix. And, and we can't just trust our hearts and trust ourselves, uh, as we already have talked about in this series. So there's a huge un, uh, lack of understanding of that. And then this is the, the final one. This is really where I want to camp out. The Bible doesn't really define God once and for all. There is a progression of understanding God, and we carry on that process today. And that is a major part of this whole concept of progressive theology. This is the idea that the Bible reflects what people believed about God in their times and in their places, but not necessarily an accurate view of God. Uh, Pete Enns, E-N-N-S, um, he says, The Bible is an ancient book, and we shouldn't uh, be surprised to see it act like one. So seeing God portrayed as a violent tribal warrior is not how God is, but how he is under, understood to be by the ancient Israelites uh, community, uh, communing with God in their time and in their place. So the one thing I would agree with him is I don't think that God is an ancient violent tribal warrior. Uh, but I don't agree with him that what we have recorded in Scripture is just their interpretation of God based on their culture. Um, and, and so that's, that's the concept. Brian McLaren, uh, coming back to what we said earlier, he believes that we, are, we understand more about God now than Moses or James. Now, here's the thing. Moses met with God till he glowed. So just show of hands. No, none of you, none of you have, have, have met with God till you glowed, right? I don't think so. Um, Anybody work at NFS? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> that's different. Uh, but, uh, but not, you know, James was a half-brother of Jesus, grew up with him, didn't want to think that he was the Messiah, but couldn't deny it, right? Like, he lived with God. So, you know, I, I, think, I think he understands. I think he understands pretty well. So there's this idea that theology or the concept or the study of, of who God is is always evolving. So is that true? Is that really true? And does that mean that we can ignore some of the revelations about him in Scripture and then redefine him in ways that we think are more appropriate? Are, are, can we do that? Because that's the concept. So, that first of all, there is no doubt that throughout Scripture we get a better and better understanding of what God is like. Right? I mean, like we get more and more and more, but only because we didn't have it all handed to us in the very first book of the Bible. Right? It doesn't tell us everything about God in the book of Genesis. But what it tells us about God is consistent with everything else that we see about God throughout Scripture. God doesn't change throughout Scripture and become something different. Very, very important to understand that. Uh, the, the, the God that we see in, in Genesis or in Matthew is, is still the same God. He hasn't changed. Um, and so what we learn about God in Revelation is not inconsistent with what we see about, uh, see about God in, say, the book of Joshua. So God was working out his plan. And one of the amazing things about this is we get to see all of his plan. Not only does he reveal to us how things happened in the very beginning and what he was like in the very beginning, but he also shows us the end of time as well in Revelation and many of the Old Testament prophets. And we get to see how God functions there as well. So we get to see the whole story that God wants to reveal to us. Um, the writer's uh, were inspired by God to reveal that information. So when a biblical writer says God says or God is, uh, it's not their flawed impression of who he is in their time. It's God revealing himself to us. So here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you three things um, that, that, that go along with this that hopefully 
will help you see this matter really, really clear from Scripture, okay? Because that's where we're going, is into Scripture to talk about this topic. So here we go. The first thing is, God does not change or evolve. Uh, Hebrews 13, 8, 9 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then I love it, follows up with, do not be carried away with all kinds of strange teachings. Like, don't get into thinking that there's something different going on or Jesus is something different than what we've revealed. Like, if, if you start teaching a different type of Jesus than what you see in Scripture, the writer's saying, no, you're off. You're off target. So the apostles, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, were extremely confident that they had seen, experienced, and properly conveyed exactly who Jesus was. Um, Malachi says, you, you may say, well, that's Jesus. But okay, let's talk about God. Okay, Jesus was God, but let's talk about uh, God from the Old Testament. Malachi 3, 6, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. God's saying to, to, to uh, the Israelites, he's saying, listen, I've made you certain promises, and if you're concerned that, that I've changed or things are going to be different than what, what I said, like, no, I don't do that. I don't change. And so he makes it absolutely crystal clear he's not going to change. In Psalm 33, uh, 11, it says, But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. God has had one plan, one purpose. He is who he said he is. He's doing what he said he was going to do. He continues to pursue us and redeem us and make us right with him and, and draw mankind back to himself. That's what he's doing. And, and that's not changing uh, that's, not, that, that, that's not becoming something different. The Bible is extremely clear. God doesn't change. So for those who want to say that God's evolving or, you know, God went out of his way to, to say in these passages and a whole lot more, oh, no, I'm not. So now here's what you may be thinking. Okay, so yeah, God doesn't change, but we didn't get, a, we didn't get an accurate view of God in Scripture. So our understanding of God is evolving and getting closer and closer and closer to what it should be. Uh, and we're still part of that process, right? And so that may, be the, that may be the pushback. But the problem is we do, uh, the problem is we do learn more about God as the Bible unfolds. But again, it's all consistent with itself. So if God, for thousands of years of revealed history in the Bible, was the same God, why do we think that, this, that God wants us to have a different impression of him now? So many times people say, well, the Old Testament, the New Testament God is so different. Is, is he really? Because uh, what I see is in the, in, in the Old Testament in Genesis, it says that sin separates us from God and brings death. You know what I see in the book of Romans? Sin separates us from God and brings death. People say, well, in the Old Testament, God was a God of wrath. And in the New Testament, God is a God of mercy. I beg to differ with you. In fact, I'm going to make a very bold claim. We see more wrath in the New Testament than we see in the Old Testament. You say, Jim, you're crazy. That is, that is crazy. Let, let, let me just ask you this. How many of you have seen the Passion of the Christ? Seen that? You watch that crucifixion scene, and here's what it hits me as. That, that is what God thinks of my sin. That is God's wrath on the things that I have done. All of God's wrath on all of our sin in one day on one man. I'm telling you, there's more wrath in the New Testament than there ever was in the Old Testament because all of it fell on Jesus. I'm telling you, like there, that, but you know what? You also see a very merciful and loving God in the Old Testament, and you see that in the New Testament too. He hasn't changed. He doesn't change. Thousands of years of revealed history, and he's still the same God. What makes us think that when Revelation dropped and ended, that we can say, oh, now I think he's, I think he's different than what they understood. Our understanding's now better. We, we, we see more now. He hasn't changed. He's still the same God. And just because God was working different parts of his plan at different times, it doesn't mean he changed. The second thing is Jesus was God's final word. Jesus was God's final word. God has worked out his plan for mankind. Everything he has done has pointed to the coming of Jesus, to his death, burial, and resurrection, and his reign to come. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says as he starts the book. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son of God is, is God. 
He's God. He made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now listen to this. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so became, he became as much superior to the angels as the, as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down. That is so important. Do you know in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Old Testament temple, there was a lot of furniture, different things that, that were there that the priests used every day. You know what wasn't there? A chair. You know why? Because the work of offering temporary sacrifices for people's sins was never finished. It never, it never ended. When Jesus came, he offered the ultimate sacrifice of himself and sat down. That's why on the cross he said, it is finished. It's over. Final word, it's done. And so when God sent Jesus, that was, you know, when, when, when God sent Jesus and his apostles wrote out the rest of that story and what it meant to us, And wrapped up with the book of Revelation, that was God's final word. Jesus was his final word. God spoke and he said, that's it. That's what you need to know about me. That's what you need to know about my plan. That's what you need to know about who I am. I'm done. There you go. Uh, And so uh, 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 there's no new way. Whatever we might want to dream up and declare as God's plan or his mindset, once God had sent Jesus and inspired the apostles to explain what that meant, God had said what he had to say about himself. Um, the last thing is just this. You can't love Jesus and change his commandments. You can't. You can't love Jesus and change his commandments. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And here's the thing. There's a lot of things that, that Jesus said that our culture likes and that, and that progressive Christians like. There's, there's a lot of things that he says, but there's also a lot of things Jesus said that does not go very well with our culture. And, and we want to kind of pick and choose. We want to say, well, you know, I like this when he says that, but I don't like that. I like when he says love your neighbor, but when he says part of loving your neighbor is to go to them when you see them in sin and help them try to admit it and turn from it. And if they won't, then you up the levels of, of, uh, of accountability. No, that's by our culture standards, that is unloving. It's judgmental. It's unloving. It's just, it's not good. But Jesus says that's loving because again, Jesus has the proper view of sin and our fallenness, and he understands how dangerous it is. And the thing he wants more than anything is for us to be free of sin. And so Jesus says it's loving. Our culture says, no, 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 it's not loving. Our culture loves to talk about how that that, that Jesus, you know, he hung out with with the sinners of, of their culture. And he did. He did. But you look at his purpose in doing it, they They don't necessarily like how the one story ends up when he's rescuing one of these people. And the last thing he says to them is, go and sin no more. Jesus was all about hanging out with with just anybody and everybody and loving everybody. Absolutely. For the purpose of bringing transformation, supernatural transformation into their lives. Because that is loving. Because that is eternal. That's going to make an eternal difference in their lives. And so that, that was Jesus' focus. We all like when Jesus said, hey, I, I fulfilled the whole Old Testament, by the way. And we're like, woo, that old crazy Old Testament. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Except, yeah, then in the same message, he took it to a whole new level. He said, you know how the Old Testament says don't murder? Well, hate's murder. Lust is adultery. Like, let's just, let's just, let's just take it and kick it up a notch. How about that? Uh, and so, you know, we, we, we like certain things that he says, but we don't like other things that, that he says. And here's the thing. We don't get to create an idol of what we would like in a God and then slap the name of Jesus on it. We don't get to do that. To follow Jesus and love Jesus means to accept what he says and realize that all of Scripture are his commands. So often we hear people say, well, Jesus didn't say that. Paul did. Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. God inspired those words that Paul wrote. And that's a whole other sermon. But, but so if Paul wrote it, I love how people want to read Philippians 4 for encouragement. But if there's something in Philippians that challenges them, they say, well, that, Paul said that, not Jesus. It's like, oh, okay. So I, I see. Um, so, so those are still the words of Jesus. Progressive theology is just another way 
to, to make God what you want him to be, thus creating a God in your own image. And it creates a more culturally palatable brand of Christianity. But in the process, listen to me, it loses the idea of God's holiness, our fallenness, God's wrath against sin, and our need for a Savior. Which is why in many cases, some progressive teachers will literally say, I don't know that it's that important that if we know if Christ actually died for people or not. It's just that he's an example. And so that we lose all of that when we create our own God. So here it is. Here's, here's some things that we, that, you know, that we can do with this. And, and I know you're thinking, boy, this ought to be interesting. Like, we just got a theology lecture, so, like, looking forward to the practical application. But here we go. Um, first of all, we need to know the truth inside and out so we can recognize when, when we're being handed a gluten-free theological brownie. Okay? We need to, we need to know that. And again, if, you're, if, if you've got dietary restrictions, I'm very, very sorry. Uh, but let's just admit, that's a struggle, right? Uh, and so, so, yeah, we need, we need to know it. We need to know it inside and out. And, and the second thing is, is kind of similar to it, but we should be familiar enough with this issue to educate our kids because our, I'm telling you, your kids are being inundated with it. And it doesn't take anything on, on, online to just go from here to here to here and here, and all of a sudden, the next thing you know, you're watching a YouTube video where, you know, literally, I, I, I'm not kidding. I literally watch YouTube videos where folks have said, um, you know, well, Jesus was racist, but then he repented of it. It doesn't take anything to get there. It does not take anything to get there uh, when you start going down the road listening to some of these people. And so we need to know this stuff, and we've got to have conversations with our children. We have to have conversations with our kids. We have to. Listen, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a struggle. If you're a parent nowadays... It's going to be, and it is harder than it's ever been. And I'm sorry, but you've got to know this kind of stuff to be able to prepare your kids. It's the lies. When Paul said perilous times are going to come and we're going to pull teachers to ourselves that will tickle our ears, like that is full on right now. And we, we've got to know some of this stuff to be able to be prepared to have those conversations with our kids. And I know that's hard, and I know that's a challenge, and I know it makes your head hurt, but your kids are going to be inundated with it. And so it's so absolutely important. The third thing is we need to be careful about what we share for others. Listen, so often I see people like, oh, this particular blog seems to make a lot of sense. And then you look at it and like it has some of this language like it's not sin that separates us from God, but it's shame. And at first you think, well, yeah, shame's a bad thing. So that's, that's a good point. But you, you, you got to pay attention to what you're reading. And then, you know, or even if the article is fantastic and you share it, but then those people are now on that person's blog and everything else on that blog is heretical, <laughs> like pay attention. Pay attention to who you're promoting uh, to other people because it's absolutely important right now. The lies are spreading. So I always say it takes hours and hours of, of bi- biblical answers to undo one, one good-sounding meme. Like, you know, people just look at it and go, oh, that, that sounds great, yeah. But then it takes hours of saying, let me tell you why. Let's dig into the Bible and figure out why that's actually not accurate. So, so, you know, those lies are spreading fast enough on their own. So let's don't, let's don't help them, right? Let's pay attention to who we're following and who we're sharing. And then the last thing is, man, I just think this, this should be encouraging to us. We should be thankful that God has revealed himself to us um, and that we are not left to argue over what we think he's like. Can you imagine if, if, like, if all bets are off and it's like, okay, the Bible got us a certain way down the road, but now it's up to us to figure out who God is today? Like, like, goodness. I mean, I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing people argue over, like, who is God and what's, what's moral and what's right and what's good and, you know, and all that kind of thing. And who is Jesus? Like, like, we see that, but for most of us, it's simple. We just go back and say, well, this is. We see it in Scripture. But can you imagine if it was really just up to us in our generation to figure out who God is? Like, is that, you, first of all, you really think God would have put us in that position? <laughs> and he didn't. He didn't. And I'm so thankful that he didn't. So, you know, I think the thing that's interesting is maybe before we decide that we need to figure out who God is now and in our generation and all that kind of stuff, maybe we ought to get in Scripture and like thoroughly look at who God has already revealed himself to be. Because I think what we're going to see there is that's a complete picture. We're good. We don't need to go any further than the Bible. um, And I don't think we should, but we don't need to because we get such an amazing, clear view of who God is in Scripture. Well, there's one more thing I think is really, really, really important. Might be the biggest takeaway. When your friend asks you to try some of their food that is missing what it really needs to taste good, 
tell them, yes, this tastes just like the real thing. No, I'm just kidding. You can't tell them that. That's a lie. But just shove it in your mouth real quick and go, mmm, like that. Uh, and, um, and that way you can minister to them in that moment. But, hey, thanks for hanging with me today. Um, I encourage you to jump, jump into some of this stuff. Um, I mean, this, people like Elisa Childers and other people like that like, do a great job of explaining this kind of stuff. I'm telling you, it is all over the place for your kids. Um, and it's super, super important that they understand the truth. Um, listen, I say all the time, we're going to raise our kids to be leaders. We don't have to worry about what they're following. And, and, and your kids need to be leaders in this area. Um, so um, let's pray. God, thank you for uh, helping us kind of dig through this today. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that you've revealed yourself. Thank you that it's clear, that it's plain. Um, and God, I, d- I just pray that you would help us to be people of the word. I pray that you would help us if, if we've believed a lie or we've headed down the wrong road, that, that you would help us to, to say, first and foremost, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to dig through Scripture and I'm going to look at what Scripture says first. Not what somebody else says, not what somebody thinks that, you know, now in our culture it, it, it should be different, but, but what does the Word of God say about who God is? God, I pray for our kids God, it's such a huge concern that I have, which is why I would take a whole Sunday to do something that sounds like a theological lecture, because I'm so concerned uh, that our kids are being sucked into this stuff and, 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 and that there's all these re-explanations and everything. And it's so, it's so alluring. Oh, you've never really been told the truth about who God is. Um, God's so much more open-minded and loving. And, but man, when we get away from the truth about how broken we are and that what sin actually does to us, we understand why a holy God is so concerned that our sins be taken away, our sins be forgiven, and that we have an opportunity to live in freedom with you. God, thank you for Jesus Christ. As Tony said, it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. He was the final answer. He was, he was the one that fulfilled it all. He was the whole direction of all of, of history was pointing to him coming. And now all of history literally points back to him because we literally keep time by his life. God, thank you for sending him. Thank you that it shows us our sin. It shows us how desperate we, we were. It shows us how much we needed him. And it also shows us how free we are in him because of an amazing, amazing savior that he is. God, I pray for anybody here this morning that has, has never kind of stepped into that, never really committed their lives to following him. Maybe they've nodded their head to the facts and they've said, yeah, that sounds good. I guess I, guess I agree with that Jesus stuff. But they've never believed it and trusted it enough to hand their lives over to it. God, I pray that today that conversation would start, whether it's with me or Justin or Chris or Tony or anybody else here on stage uh, or just anybody in, in, in a blue shirt. God, I just pray that, um, that God, conversations would start today that hearts would turn to you, that that they would experience the freedom that you literally spent thousands of years bringing to us and have now made available to us through your son, Jesus Christ. And so, God, thank you. Thank you that you love us enough to reveal yourself to us. Thank you that you love us enough to let us know you personally. Uh, And thank you, God, uh, for Jesus uh, and that final word uh, that he speaks into our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.